Let's go back to Mark chapter 11. This is trigger words. Part 15. Are y'all ready? All right. I hope I didn't put y'all to sleep with the announcements. I need, I need you to be attentive, be excited. Don't let this air conditioner wear you down. Amen. Amen. Mark 11. So we are talking about how to release kingdom power. So a lot of things, I'm going to stay closer to my notes than I did in the last service because I want to get a few things across to you. We're in week 15, but last week uh, I left Pastor Gillian on the stage and I heard that y'all had church up in here. She had people walking up to her in the grocery store. And, and they were saying, you can have what you say. And so it was exciting uh, to hear the response to that. And I know that um, when I leave you guys, if I leave my wife here, you're in good hands. But I, if, if I do leave, I don't take many Sundays off. But when I do leave, you're going to be in good hands. Amen? Amen? Praise God. Well, let's talk about some serious things. Mark chapter 11. I'm going to bounce off of this. So let me read through it kind of quick. So we're talking about the principle of releasing the power that you already have. So get your notebook ready. Uh, Jesus is talking to, he, he just cursed the fig tree. We know that, right? He just cursed the fig tree. There's a lesson in that. But I want to show you something else. Peter, remember what he did. He said, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. They're passing back by. Now, this is 24 hours after he did it. So not at the moment that he did it, but the next day, right? So Jesus answered him. What did he say? He said, have faith in God. What did he say? I've been writing this on the board a lot lately. Have faith in God. But we translated that, didn't we? To have faith that God creates. All right, I'm going to add something to that, okay? When God gives you faith, you are given an authority to speak. All right? Now, faith that God creates. Now, how does God create his faith? Faith comes by? How does it come? Hearing and hearing what? The word. So God creates faith by hearing. How does he create faith? By hearing. And hearing what? His word. All right. So you got to hear the word of God. Now, when you hear the word of God, the next step to hearing the word of God and making this principle work for you is you have to obey what you heard. All right. So in this context here, he says, have faith in God. All right. Now, let's keep going. Verse 23. Surely I say to you, whoever says to the mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that the things he says will be done. You see all this authority here? Believe what you say will be done. All right? He'll have whatever he says. All right. What does he do to the mountain? Speaks, speaks to the mountain. How does he speak to the mountain? He speaks to the mountain from faith. All right? Now, faith is not just knowing what God said, I heard what he said, but also obeying what he said. So I didn't speak out of my own volition. I didn't speak because I heard in church you're supposed to speak this stuff. Watch how nuanced this is. I didn't speak until I was commanded to speak. Here's what happens to church people. We learn a principle a key that releases the kingdom, and then we just run off doing it, and God ain't told us to do it. Watch out. This is subtle, but this is important. I want you to see this. Have faith in God. I, how did I get faith? I heard. Now, that ain't just saying I heard it before, or I have read it before. No, this is saying right in the middle of this opposition, I heard what God said to me. Then he commanded me. I heard the word. He commanded me. Now I'm under authority. So, I don't speak just out of my own idea. I'm under command. And because I'm under command and under that authority, I'm submitted to God. I'm waiting for him to tell me how to handle this mountain. Now, everything that you face, God's not going to say, speak to. Now, even though we are talking about trigger words, and this is because speaking is the primary and most foundational part of how you release your authority because this is how God releases his authority. This is how God created the world, and this is how God functions. At some point, there's going to be some words involved, okay? But I want you to see this. I didn't speak until I had faith, and until by that faith, faith caused 
an impulse or an action to be prompted. When I got faith, it unlocked a behavior. When I got faith, it unlocked conduct. Faith without action is dead. But I had to have faith that gave me and unlocked a different behavior than what I was doing before. But faith came with the instruction of speech. So until I got that that, that word and got that faith in my spirit, I didn't just jump up and when as soon as I saw the mountain, my first reaction, my knee-jerk reaction was to speak to it. Let me tell you why. Because although we're covering it in this uh, reference, you got to be in a relationship with God. All right? Because God doesn't do everything the same every single time. And so here's what happens. We learn a principle and then we do it without being commanded to do it. Now, I have no doubt that at some point God's going to tell you to speak. But you got to wait until he tells you to speak, to speak. In other words, you got to turn your attention to your commander. And when he gives you the impulse to speak, then you speak. But then when you speak, you speak what he said to speak. I'm going to tell you why. Because faith doesn't work unless it has action. But that action must be an obedient action. Meaning it must follow a command. Are you getting this? Faith is not just, because here's what church people do. They get something, then they just start binding and loosening. I command you, devil. Right? All of this stuff. Well, where does the power come from? We're talking about delegated power. Where does the power come from? It comes from my commander. And it doesn't have power unless I was told to do it. Now, we think that because we have a general order to be on the earth and taking territory that we can just throw our words around because God's going to back up every one of them. But let's get more detailed and scientific about this thing. Because some stuff you speak to. Some stuff you ignore. You're not listening. So if God says, listen, that mountain, I want you to speak to it. All right? That's the one we're specifying right now. But you got to be careful because if you jump out ahead of God, then God might say, that mountain, ignore it. Don't say nothing to it. Leave it alone. That next thing I want you to lay hands on. That next thing I want you to do this. I want you to see every time God deals with a situation, it's not the exact same. And it's not the exact same phrases. What God does not like is thinking that your prayers will get answered because of your many words. So we bind it and loosen and bind it and loosen and bind it and loosen and bind it and loosen. Now he might have, I'm telling you, your words are going to be involved at some point. But the strategy of your words is important. For example, the woman with the issue of blood, she was told to speak, but she didn't speak to the issue. She spoke to herself. She said, if I could touch, now this is her faith talking, because Jesus didn't say, you know, it was your this or that that made you whole. He didn't even say it was my power that healed you. He said, it was your faith. So when we see her activity and her behavior, where did she get that? The Holy Ghost. See, the Bible says she heard of Jesus. When she started hearing of Jesus, the Holy Spirit is in that giving the commands and is going to prompt the activity. So she says, by the Spirit, if I can touch the hem of the garment. This faith is giving her command, it's giving her pictures, and it's giving her activity. So she's beginning to move. She didn't just think of that. She was prompted to do that because she heard something about Jesus. She said, man, I heard about him. And so by that hearing, she developed the faith. You got it? And that faith came with a command. And that command told her, speak to yourself. She didn't say, I command you blood. Dry up. I command you to stop. I command you to quit. Now, that's good, right? That's going to work if God tells you to do that. Are y'all getting this? Because see, listen, why, why sometimes stuff is not working. Because you went, too, you went too fast. You went too fast. Your relationship with God has to be a real relationship. You got to hear what he's saying. He's probably going to tell you to say something, but you need to wait till he tells you to say it. He's not going to let you die before you say it. But, I mean, and it can be mighty quick, you know. A situation arises, you can turn to God and have something instant, instantly. Or you can just feel something just surge out of you from your spirit. You know, it ain't going to necessarily be an hour of prayer, then you know. It might be instantaneous. By the prompting of the Lord, bang, right now I said it. 
So she spoke to herself. In this case, you speak to the mountain. Are you understanding? So words are going to be involved, but we have to be under command and have authority in our words. So if we are speaking, even though you are generally under command on the earth, then we have to make sure that we have been commanded to do something that specific type of way. Is that making any sense to you? <clears throat> so the Bible says that the enemy will flee from you if you resist him. The Bible says resist the devil and he will flee, right? But the verse before that says submit to God. So we can resist, 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 but until we submit to God, that means get under God's, not just we are submitted to him like he's our Lord. Submit to God means bring yourself to him for an answer because he's your commanding officer. In other words, how would you like me to dispatch this enemy? Resist the devil from the obedience, from that submission, and then he will flee. If you resist the devil without being submitted, the devil don't have to flee from you. Because the devil's not worried about you. The devil's worried about who you represent. So when you speak in the name of Jesus under the command of God, <clears throat> then you're going to have results. Are you, hear are you hearing this now? So Jesus said, speak to the mountain. Amen. And next verse, you'll have whatever you say. Okay. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe you receive them and you will have them. So also when you pray, when you pray, believe. When you pray, believe. Believe what? What does it tell you to believe? Believe that what? Receive. Believe that you receive. Believe that you receive. Now, again, this is a little bit of review. When I pray... When I go to God, I'm going to believe. What am I going to believe? I'm going to believe that I receive when I pray. Why am I, but why am I going to believe that I receive? Because the Bible says that if I pray anything according to his will, that I have these petitions that I've asked of him. He's granted my request. Isn't that right? Okay, so then if I believe, I'm without, it doesn't say, this is where people get messed up. It doesn't say you feel like you received. Correct? It didn't say I felt like I received. It didn't say I saw that I received. No. Just believe it. So you see where the issue is. The issue is in what we're believing. And when you believe something, it's going to have power behind it. And you got to believe. How do you develop your faith or your belief? You got to develop it in what God says. All right. And then, so that's, that's general belief. But then there is belief that is prompted or commanded in the situation so that you don't just run around you know, the Bible, Jesus says, I will give you the keys of my kingdom. These are the principles that trigger heaven's authority. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Okay? That phrase actually means whatever heaven has bound, you bind. That translation doesn't mean you get to tell God what to do. That's important. You should write that down. That, that authority teaching is not correct. It's very... It's very close, but it's not exactly correct. That translation actually says, it says, whatever you bind should be what God has already bound. You don't just get to bind. Because <clears throat> the devil will have you thinking you bound something. I mean, think about this. If you bind something and the devil's smart, you get what I'm saying? More cunning than any beast of the field. If, you, if the devil is doing some kind of activity, now watch out. I'm just going to expose him today, okay? Are you all right with that? Don't let him be your friend. I'm going to tell on him right now. Look, just imagine you're the devil, right? And, and you say, and you know, the devil knows you don't know. He knows you don't have the really truth of that scripture. And you say, devil, I bind you. Stop right now in the name of Jesus. And it's like a game of red light, green light. And he's like, now he, he stopped not because he had to. He wanted you to think you stopped him. He didn't have to. He's playing with you. So the activity stopped. The symptom went away. The situation looked like it was remedied. You turn your back and it comes right back. You're like, well, wait a minute now. Did not bind me? He said, yeah, you did. You did. You bound me. You did. I, I stopped for a minute. See, he's playing with you. But if you bind what was already bound, then there's authority. Then he can't continue. 
You see the difference? I'm doing what God said to be done. I'm, I'm doing what God commanded me and gave me permission to do. I'm not just walking around with keys that I can just throw around myself. I'm walking around with keys, but I have to have commands with the keys. Are you getting it? I need my, I need command. So even though you know I have permission to use, I still need also a command to do. All right. So you got to make sure that if you're in a situation, you're not just running around throwing keys that you learned out somewhere because God might have a, because it's, remember, it's keys of the kingdom, many keys. So certain enemies require certain nuances, might be very similar to the way you dealt with one before, but a little different. And you just need God to give you the difference. You're going to speak to things. You're going to bind and loose things. You're going to lay hands on some things. You're going to ignore some things. All right? But you don't want to just run around talking ahead of God. Even though God might have you say exactly what you said before, you want to make sure that I first have faith. Are you understanding this? So your faith is always there, but the way it works is because you have Christ in you, you have to make sure you make that connection before you start talking. You get what I'm saying? Or in other words, get in faith. Get in faith. I know I have faith, but am I in faith? Am I, am I tapped into it? Am I doing it from faith? Or am I doing it? Now, here's the difference. There is the works of the flesh, which are religious, which look like faith. But then there are the good works or works of the spirit that come out of my faith. So did I even look inside of the faith that I have in me or the concepts or keys of the kingdom that I even make sure I connected first before I started talking or doing. I'm teaching this already. Are y'all awake? All right. So now when we are discussing this topic of, of releasing the power of heaven, uh, it's a challenging thing for a lot of people to get any results for some of these reasons, because one, they either don't really believe, but let's assume you got to the believe part. But then after you believe and you prayed or you spoke, now you're waiting or you're feel, waiting to feel something or see something. And Jesus says this about belief in Matthew 13. He says that when anybody hears the word of the kingdom, two things happen. The enemy comes immediately to snatch away the word that was sown in his heart. Now, he can't take the word out of your heart physically. I mean, he can't, he can't snatch it away. But what it means by snatch away is he sows a contradiction right beside it, wheat and tear, right beside it to make your attention turn from what God said to what now this new thing or contradiction is, whether it be a thought that contradicts, whether it be a sign, a symptom, uh, something that goes against it. In other words, he snatches your attention away. From what God says. So God tells you this and then the enemy immediately comes and sows this doubt and you turn your attention. Now faith doesn't work unless you can hold on to it while you're operating. Belief doesn't work. So then the next thing Jesus says, he says, another thing is that some people hear the word and they receive it. But then it says they only believe for a little while. So there's the other problem. See, I did believe. Did you believe long enough to bear the fruit? See, I believed. Okay, we think, oh, I believed, I got it. I, I believed and I said. And then you said, well, then the enemy sows a contradiction and the cares of the world come in and all these different things come to choke the word and before it can bear the fruit or see the, see the result, you let go of it or you stop believing. Believing is activity, people. Listen, belief is a verb. Belief is not a noun, it's a verb. Faith is a noun. Faith and belief are related, but they're not exactly the same. Faith is the substance. It's a thing. Belief is the lifestyle and action prompting, produced by your faith. So did you believe long enough? Did you, did you submit yourself long enough? Submission, actively submitted. Am I, am I actively listening? Am I actively holding on to it? Am I actively taking care of it, not letting the enemy steal it from me, not taking my attention away from it. Did you believe long enough? Because sometimes people come to church and they get a little word and they say, oh, that's amazing. That's, praise God. I just, and you get so inspired in this environment because it's easy to believe in here. Then you get outside and the contradiction hits you right in the face. It comes right back. And then you go, oh, Lord. And immediately, let me tell you what, what, what belief is. Belief has you attached to whatever you believe in. It has you acting under it. It has you following it. Jesus said there's a problem. He said, uh, if you go back to verse 23, he said, when you speak, you, you can't doubt or have unbelief. 
So faith is not always your problem. Unbelief is. Because unbelief belief is the verb. So I have faith. Yes, you have faith. But are you believing? It's different. Because if I'm believing, then I'm having the activity or the, this is what I said last service, the lifestyle. Belief turns into not just a thing that I did once. Belief, how do I know what I believe? It becomes my lifestyle or it becomes my mode of operation or as we say about the kingdom, it becomes my culture. How do I know if I believe? How do I know what I believe? Let me look at your lifestyle. Because you might say, I believe, but you actually only have faith. Faith without action, belief, is dead. Faith without the lifestyle, faith without, as I said last time I was on the stage, faith without conduct, remember conduct means to communicate something or like the, the uh, I talked about the electricity in the wall, the power is already there, but it has a wire that conducts it from one place to the next. So your conduct, this is why people say, oh, I believe in God, and you never see any power from those people. You never see any change. You never see any transformation. You never see any of that. Why? Because they have improper conduct. They have immorality. They have, they're sleeping around with everybody. They're doing what they want to. Their mouth flying everywhere. They're watching what they want. They're doing what they want. They don't have the cultural conduct to make the power flow. Conduct, belief, is fleshed out in representation. Representative conduct. I need to see your faith. Once your faith has found conduct, I mean it has found obedient conduct. You have willfully, am I giving you too many definitions? Faith, listen, let me let y'all get this one before I show you the next piece. Y'all got this? I'm giving you a thousand definitions of belief, okay? Belief. All right, we said it's conduct. It is willfulness. Willfulness. You know what willfulness is? This is how you receive something. You can't receive anything unless it's a willful reception. So in other words, if I believe I have willingly allowed that idea from God to transform my culture, and my morality and my conduct. I have allowed the influence of the kingdom to now become my behavior, my now culture. It's not that me, you know, when you first start doing it, it feels kind of like a put on, you know, you're kind of doing something that you believe in, but it ain't quite programmed so far down into you that it's automatic. So at first it feels a little like you moved to a new country in which you did. You moved from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of God. You moved to this new country. Now you're around all these other people and the Holy Ghost is now your, your uh, leader. And so on the inside, he's teaching you all these new things about who you really are and your, cult, your conduct is changing. You're starting to watch what you say because let no foul thing proceed from your mouth. It's not because, am I going to hell for saying whatever? Well, it's not about you going to hell, but heaven can't come to earth. That's not the issue. I ain't going to hell for that, but heaven ain't coming because of that. You get what I'm saying? Why should you watch your mouth? Because heaven comes through your mouth. Why should you watch your behavior? Because heaven comes through your behavior. I need to see your, God's not measuring your lifestyle. He's using your lifestyle. You get what I'm saying? See, this is what these celebrities and people on TV will teach you. I believe in God. You got a little bit of faith, but you ain't got no power. And also, you're misleading a bunch of people. You're giving them mixture in their beliefs. Yes, it's harder to live for God when you have a nature like we had in the fall. Yes, it's harder, but I don't want to hear your excuses. Do it. Quit crying about it. It's very difficult, you know, to follow God. Life is tough. What can I say? What can I say? But so was walking when you first tried. You fell all over the place. You need to get up and keep going. But here's what I do know. Without the conduct, there'll be no power. See, we get mixed up. Jesus forgave my sins. He absolutely did. He empowered you to represent him. So now the conduct needs to match or the power won't be conducted. You need to communicate with your mouth and then through your activity. If your conduct don't match your mouth, there won't be no power. I don't care how many times you say it. 
You remember what I said last week? So I spoke it to activate it. Remember that? I spoke it because that's how you activate it. I spoke it. Okay, whether I spoke to myself or ever how God told me to manage that. But I still, after that, I got to go conduct. In other words, I got to act. I got to follow or act like a believer. Like a believer in the kingdom conduct, the culture of heaven. Now I have to act and show and demonstrate to people what it looks like to function as a person with uh, um, provision, power, and authority. Somebody that's operating in a different dimension. That's what a believer is doing. A believer is operating on a higher mode, a higher culture. So that's why I can never be worried about my finances when they look low. I can never be worried about my body when it looks hurt. I can never be worried about situation that looks like it's going down. Why? Because I'm living from a different dimension and I'm bringing that con, I'm showing you what it looks like to handle a conflict from a different level. I'm preaching better than y'all clapping. Y'all didn't miss me. I'm going to leave the country again if y'all don't love me when I come back. I missed y'all. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I know you're learning. So are you getting this? See, it's very, it's very nuanced. And I'm, not, I'm off my notes, but I, I, I'm trying to minister to you. I'm trying to minister to you. So again, yes, our mouth is the point of of triggering heaven's authority there's authority when i say to one go they go when i say to one come they come that's how the roman centurion operated right but you got to understand something if if jesus said i will have what i say sometimes you're going to say something and god's going to command somebody else to carry it out well like when you say it i have soldiers under me i have servants under me but also everything that god owns and has can work for my uh solution but that doesn't mean you get to sit around idle Because your conduct, morality, and how you behave, it's not being measured to get you into heaven, but it is being measured to let the power flow from heaven. Because you got to understand, there has to be, I hope this ain't too deep for y'all. Watch this. There has to be the relationship between heaven and earth, fundamental kingdom thing. Let me just teach it one more time. Little easy diagram. Heaven, earth, okay? Heaven, earth. In order for these two things to communicate, there has to be a compatible, this is the conduct. Or can we say like in an electrical term, that's the conductor. Now, proper conductor, you got to have an electricity, you got to have aluminum, you got to have, you know, copper, a good conductor, right? Got to have some good, a good type of conductor. Same thing with heaven to earth. You got to have a good conductor. Something, another word for conduct would be communication. That's about your communing, your oneness, your relationship. There has to be, you and God have to be one in agreement to communicate. See how scientific this is? We have to communicate what comes out of his mouth has to be what shows up in my mouth. What comes out of his beliefs has to show up in my beliefs. What comes out of his behavior has to show up in my behavior. What comes out of, in, a, in a crisis, what am I doing? I'm doing exactly what God showed me to do. If God said go to Israel during a conflict, who am I to say? Because you know, I had every, not, not every, but a lot of Christians, why are you going to Israel? I said, I, I'm not, how can I not? I don't operate like you. Not you, but them. I don't operate like you. I don't, I don't check how safe it is. I check, did he say it? Because can I tell you something? The devil is a bully. And if he can get you to stop one activity because he scared you, he'll pin you in a corner. You'll never get out. If he, if he can strike fear in your heart for one thing, he'll put you in the corner. He'll never let you out because you'll be checking how safe it is. Can I give you one more scripture? God says, do not be careful for anything. You know why I went to Israel? Because I'm not careful. I'm trying to be obedient, not careful. I'm trying to be obedient. You don't think I didn't weigh out the fact that I might not make it back? You don't think I thought of that? It's not a game. You don't think I didn't think that there could be a major conflict to erupt right when I got there and I get all they close all the airspace and not let me come home for three months? You didn't think I thought of that? Of course I did. But I'm not careful. I'm faithful. See, I'm going to tell you something. This is break. Somebody, you're going to get this right now. 
I'm not telling you to be reckless. As long as God said, don't just try to daredevil everything. If God said, believe me, there will be an opposition to it. If God said, please write that down. Pastor Mike said, if God said, not me just trying to be a daredevil. Some, if God said, don't go, I wouldn't go. And I wouldn't be afraid to tell you, like, you know, I don't know if it's because of the war, but it might be something else. I don't know. But he didn't say not to go. So, right? So, but if God tells you to do something, there's going to be a conflict. It might be a huge conflict. The devil might come after you with all guns blazing. You don't know what the heck is going on, right? But you got to be faithful. God said, oh, oh, should I stop? God said, well, check with me. Did I say stop or did I say go? You getting this? Because, listen, because here's the thing. There has to be a communication for the power. That means there has to be proper conduct. Proper conduct. How, is there joy in heaven? Is there? Okay, then that's my conduct. Because joy is not because I'm trying to make people happy. Joy is because I'm trying to let heaven flow. So the Bible says, hey, when you're in a tough situation, rejoice. Why? Why? It's not because God is giving you psychological tricks. Like the world tries to tell you. You know, if you're really, if you're, even in the world sciences, you get a little advantage from just being positive, you know. But that's not what we're trying to say here. What we're talking about is what is in heaven. Jesus said, let it be done on the earth. Pray, kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. The kingdom is a culture, and you have to communicate that culture. In other words, you need to let all the lost people know what heaven is like. And how am I going to let them know what it's like? Well, in good times, I praise. Why? It's not because there's great times on the earth. It's because that's what's happening in heaven. And I'm just here to communicate to you what's going on in the realm right above your senses. The, realm, the kingdom of heaven is present right now. I'm going to communicate that to you. I'm not going to communicate my issue. I'm going to communicate what God just said to me. I'm not going to communicate the problem. You want me to talk about the problem? You want me to talk about the solution? And see, when you don't talk about the problem, everybody gets mad at you because they want you to join their pity party. And you say, well, I'm not joining the pity party. I'm in God's party. And God's party is happy. Your pity party is sad. God's having a good party right now. He said, but he sees all this trouble. Does he sees my problems? Yes, he does. But he's wanting you to join his party and leave yours. Somebody say conduct. See, whatever you have seen God say or do in heaven, you don't want to just have faith for it. You're going to have to have some conduct behind it. And that includes our attitudes. That includes everywhere. And I know it's a difficult thing. I know it's a challenge. I didn't say it was easy, but it is simple. Can I keep teaching? Hallelujah. So this is why sometimes it falls short, because we got to understand there has to be a compatible conduct. Because with, with incompatible conduct, it's like having an incompatible wire between two electrical, like a switch and a, and a light bulb. Okay, you can't have a rubber wire between the two because rubber doesn't conduct electricity very well, does it? All right, you have to have something that lets it flow really good, really fast, really clear, and instantaneously, don't you? Man, if the devil... See, this, this righteous teaching that churches still uh, teach people about you know being righteous so that God will bless you and all that type of stuff, God's already blessed you. God's already died for you. God's already forgiven you. God's already given you power. You don't have any supply problems. You have conduct problems. And if you let God fix your conduct, he's trying to make you a conductor of blessing. By which you will also receive the blessing. You don't think the inside of the hose pipe gets wet for letting the water run through it? You say, well, what, is, what about me? You the hose pipe. You don't think, yeah, I mean, you're going to get a, if it's flowing through you, it's on me. That's also why I don't understand why people want church people to be broke. I don't get it. If it's flowing through me, you don't think it's going to get on me? Listen, we got to make biblical conduct, kingdom culture famous again. We got to stop saying, well, it's the grace of God, so I don't have to worry about my behavior. Listen, to it. without that behavior, the power ain't going to flow. It's not to make it flow. It's to allow it to flow. God ain't in heaven going, you're being bad. I'm not going. He can't turn it off. God's always on. You became an improper conductor. 
Because through Jesus, you are already saved. You are already righteous. You are, I mean, that's the great thing about that part. But again, God's not out. You know, he's not saying, well, the, the job is over. I can't wait for all of y'all to pass away so I can get you back to heaven. God's trying to get the heavenlies to show up and bear, be, go, come to bear in the earth. Man, hallelujah. I, that makes me excited. All right, so let's keep going. Now, Jesus said, if you don't doubt, let me take just a few minutes on doubt because I want you to understand some of the things that do block it, all right? So what is doubt? Improper conduct. It's the opposite of belief in a sense um, because if belief, if you go back to the other screen, it's a lifestyle and a culture. I know what you believe by what you're doing. And if you think, oh, I'm a believer, I'm a believer, you might have faith, but you might not have belief. All right. So so if you believe you're going to feel the as I said a couple of weeks ago, you're going to feel the, there's a freedom, an unlocking of behavior. Now, in other words, a freedom to do freedom to do what I couldn't do. Now, when Jesus had issues with people, it's because they didn't have belief, which is very closely related to faith, but not exactly the same. It's just it's like faith in motion. All right. I'm willfully allowing the culture of heaven, I moved into the, so imagine you moved to the United States, but you refuse to assimilate. Okay? You have faith, but you don't have belief. That's a great example. I have faith, but I'm not becoming an American. I'm holding tight to my old self. But that's not the deal, is it? If you move, if you immigrate to America, you have to become American. I'm using the, you get, what I'm, you, you get my analogy here. You have to become an American. You have to love America. You have to turn your back on your old country. How many times have I shown you the, uh, the agreement that naturalized citizens have to say in front of a United States government official, I pledge allegiance, and at the end of it, they give this whole speech, and at the end of it, they say, if war breaks out, I will fight for America even against my old country. Now, most people want the benefit. I'm using America, kingdom of God, and darkness and all that. Most people will use the benefit of America, but if war breaks out against their old country, they probably join their old country. Because that's how connected it is. Now, here's the thing. When you, this is what the children of Israel did. The reason they couldn't enter the promised land was because of unbelief. Unbelief. God said, go into the promised land. And they said, there's giants in the land. God said, wait a minute, didn't I just walk you through? First of all, I delivered you from the Pharaoh, didn't I? All right. Then I took you out in the wilderness. Didn't I supply every need? Didn't I give you water? Didn't I give you food? Didn't I give you provision? Didn't I make sure your clothes didn't wear out? Didn't I take care of you? Didn't I give you fire by night, uh, cloud by day? Didn't I cover you from the sun? Didn't I do all of that? And it's that, so anyway, didn't I, so in other words, didn't I teach you how to have faith and trust? Now I'm asking you to believe and obey. Go into the promised land. Guess what they halted at? The giants. Because they never allowed it to become their own identity, what God was doing in the wilderness. They never took it. They kept the Egypt identity. So listen, at the, at the doorstep of entering their promise, they would rather go back to their old country. You can readily see that in any country when there's immigration allowed. Right? You can see that. If there's a conflict, people want to go home. Or they want to defend their country. I mean, how, how else do you get... In a place like America, you come in, but then you fight for another country. How else? Because it's still, that old identity is there. So how else does a person have faith in God, and then God says, trust me, trust me. Whatever's facing you, I'm with you. I'm with you. Go take it. And you get the command. And now you got to go. And then you're like, well, what is, pull, what is the pulling you back? The Bible said it was unbelief. You didn't even believe. They didn't believe what God said. They didn't want to move on his command. I'm teaching it. All right. So now, dealing with that, Jesus said, if you speak, but you can't doubt. Isn't it funny that he put that in there? Why didn't he just say speak? If you speak, it's going to happen. If you speak, because your words are filled with so much power. He said, yes, but you can't doubt. You can't doubt. Right? We got to deal with the doubt. You got some doubt. Doubt, or, or let's call it unbelief, right? Doubt or unbelief. So this is kind of what I want to deal with. It's a little bit of a new direction today, all right? You got this? So once we have uh, the, the word of faith in our heart, he said, you still can't doubt. Doubt is an issue, so we need to talk more about that. I want to put up Mark chapter 6, 
show you this real quick. Verse 2. Y'all awake, right? You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna put this into operation this week. You're going to put this into operation this week. You're going to understand and you're going to have faith and you're going to have belief. In other words, you're going to willfully allow God to flow through you. Belief. Willfully allow God to flow through me. God, it's not because you hate me that you want my conduct to straighten up. It's because you want to flow through me. Yeah. Can I give you an example? Uh, where is Pastor Kevon at? Is he in the room or is he outside somewhere? If y'all can find him, I'll give you an example of this in a second. All right. When the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? And what wisdom is that? Now, synagogue, you got to understand, I don't have time to teach all this, but if you go to Israel with me, this is going to come alive to you. There was a young lady who, this is the first time I drove around Israel, and the young lady who, just the nicest person you ever meet, right? And I said, I said, hey, do you go to church? You know, I'm just doing what pastors do. And she said, I go to synagogue. There's, there's Pastor Kevon. So, Pastor Kevon, can you do me a favor? Can you just, I need you to just walk all the way over. Pastor Joseph, stand up for me. Walk across there. This strapping young man. <laughs> come back, come back over here. I got a point to this. All right. All right, now turn around and go back to Pastor Joseph. Y'all watch him now. Okay. Now, I took Pastor Kevon. Y'all give him a hand. That was nice demonstration. Okay. Let me tell you why it's important. Uh, I took Pastor Kevon to Israel with me. He travels with me sometimes, and um, he done all the filming, all the video edits and all that. It was, it was really good. He makes it come alive. But listen, when we got back, for some reason, this, we got back Tuesday night about 2 in the morning, but I don't know, the next day or Thursday, I came up here to meet him for something, and he was walking like this. I mean, gingerly. I was like, what is wrong with you? He was like, I don't know. So he, he pulled the back of his pan up, and his Achilles around that area was swollen. Swollen. I mean, and so I just said, you know, I said, hmm. So anyway, we just, started, we just talked about what we were talking about. I didn't say anything. I'm, you know what I'm doing mainly? I'm just kind of listening. I'm listening to God. I'm just, I was, let me see. You know, so I didn't even say anything. I, told, I said, hey, when you go home tonight, I said, here, step number one. I said, if I were you, I'd pray. And then I'll just see what God says and then speak to it. He said, yeah, I'm going to do that, of course. That's what we, know. That's what we learned. That's what I'm going to do. So he came back. So the next day, we came up here Saturday now. So the next day, he came back up here, and we had a, a leadership meeting. And all the leaders were together, and we were strategizing and some stuff. And he's still walking exactly the same. Exactly the same. I mean, barely getting through. Got a brace on it. Wrapped it up. Right? So he's barely getting through. I know he probably went home and prayed and all that. Right. And so uh, we had a meeting and then we went to the building next door where we did all the renovations. And it's really beautiful. It's got some little odds and ends left, but I wanted to show the, the leaders what we've been doing. So we went over there to pray for all of that. We went outside to the new outdoor area that we're putting together. And so we went out and then right before we we prayed over the space and all that. Right before we left, God said, pray for Kavon. Wait a minute now. Listen now. I, he said, pray for Kavon. So I said, all right, Kavon, come over here in the middle. And all the leaders, we got together. And so they all, everybody jumped down on the ground and stretched their hands out, laid hands on him. I said, now, <clears throat> Lord, we thank you that he is whole. We know that. Spiritually speaking, he is healed, not going to be healed, was healed, is healed right now, presently healed, right? We know that. He's limping now. Okay, I mean, he's, just, I mean, came very badly, okay? And so... And he told me he was in a lot of pain. And so we, we laid hands on him. And then when we got done, I said, all right, now conduct it. And, and, and we all, all of us just turned around and left. He, he walked behind everybody like this. At the moment, he didn't, nothing changed. Not a thing. Not a thing. Are y'all getting this? Please get this. But I didn't pay no more attention to it. You know why? Because I read the story like the fig tree. I believed when I prayed, and I ignored, see, belief lets you move on. <laughs> Doubt holds you hostage. You keep checking it. Oh, is it, oh, is it, oh, 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 check the bank, check the name, call your boy, call, call y'all, y'all good. Yeah, I mean, doubt has you checking everything. Authority 
when you do it following what God said, lets you move on. In other words, freedom happens. Freedom happens. Why? Because God is at work. If I released it, I have soldiers working. I have servants working. If I, if I released it, now he's still got to walk. He still got to conduct it as if it's so. In other words, he could sit down. He could cry about it. He could probably his foot He could say, babe, and tell him, I come rub my foot because, you know. And, I'm, and that's not a bad idea. That's cool, you know, whatever. But eventually, he can't sit there and be passive about the thing. Because if God says you're healed, you got to go do something with it. So, so, so he did it right. So, so we were leaving, and he said, oh, Pastor Mike. He said, it was still hurting. He said, but tomorrow I'm going to be running around. I'm going to be running around, Pastor Mike. Tomorrow I'm going to be good. And so, I, you know, I didn't think nothing about it. And I came in this morning, and I, he was walking. I didn't even think anything. You know what I'm saying? And he was like, Pastor Mike. I was like, yeah. He was like, Pastor Mike, look, 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 look. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Come on. Come on. Come on. Listen, believe in no doubt. Believe what you say shall be done. Believe that God is at work. When you cast out the word of authority, you cast off the burden for change. Casting your cares upon the Lord means operating in authority. Okay? So we did that. Now, we have to deal with this because if we doubt it, it'll hold us to checking it every five minutes. If we doubt it, it'll be like we're, we're it'd, be, it'd almost be like we're questioning God's integrity. God said this would happen, but then we're just going to keep checking on it. But see, his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. I don't know how he did it. I don't know if Kevon went to sleep last night and he got up this morning. He was like, well, that's, that's a whole lot better. And if you've seen it start to amend, you just keep going. If it got 10% better, it's already finished. If it got 5% better, it's already finished. If it ain't none better, you still got to assume it's finished. But if it starts amending, you got to say, good, I'm just going to keep walking. See, most people go to the doctor to find out how the devil's fighting them. We don't need to know how to, we don't need to know the name of it every time. I don't, I don't mind if you do go, but what happens when most people go is they get really bound to doubt. The doctor reaffirms you got a problem. He, he ain't going to pull out the Bible and preach to you. Even if he's a believer, he's got to get paid. I believe you're going to get better. Take two of these and <laughs> make sure I get my commission. Now, there's some really good doctors that are helping folks, but you get my point. You don't want to bind yourself to a system when God's got another system. Because a lot of times, there ain't going to be no help naturally, okay? All right, now, can I finish this? All right. And when the Sabbath came, okay, they were astonished. Where did the man get these things? All right, next verse. I'm going to go faster. Go to verse 3. Is this not the carpenter's son? And they named his family, okay? James, Joseph, Judas, Simon, um, are these not his sisters with us? So they, then they were offended at him. Go figure. But Jesus said, a prophet is not without honor or he's not accepted. He's not honored. He's not willfully allowed to function except in his own country, among his own relatives. So again, this is an important thing. Your natural, so relatives can be the human, the human race or your human thoughts. These are your relatives. So what happens is your relatives, even if it ain't just people, because it could be people, but if you're by yourself and you're about to do something in faith, your relatives, the things you were relative to before, All right. I like that. your carnal mind, the relativeness, I'm just trying to be relevant. Well, your relatives, <laughs> I'm going to make sure you are relevant to the carnal world. So these natural thoughts, because they're your relatives and all your relatives talk too much anyway, you know that. So that's the, look, that natural example is what's happening in your spirit. You get ready to operate on something and your natural mind does not want to accept it. And he's going to show you how to do this now. Verse five, now he could do no mighty work there except he laid his hand on a few sick people and he healed those people. All right. Then they marveled. Uh, then he marveled. Verse six. What did he marvel at? He marveled at their unbelief. Unbelief or doubt is when you are believing or having two different realities in your mind at the same time. In other words, there's a natural truth and a spiritual truth. One of these has got to be a lie. So Jesus said, it's not going to work if you speak to something, but still consider any of the natural signs, symptoms, or facts that go through your head. 
He said, when you speak, you have to stand firm on the side of what God said, despite what you see or taste or feel or sense. That doesn't mean God did not move. As soon as you spoke, you were able to trigger that thing from one dimension, which it was already in reserve, into this dimension, and it has already begun. Are you getting this? But isn't it interesting that Jesus went to every other city and cleared the town of disease and sickness and everything else, but in his own, in his own hometown, the power wouldn't flow. What was the issue? The issue was not faith. The issue was their unbelief. The issue was their unbelief. In other words, they were not allowing his influence to flow. And isn't it funny? I said this a million times. I need you to get this. Isn't it funny that what we believe has access into our lives, whether it is good or bad. And if we have been trained by the word, I'm going to give you a scripture for this on your way out. If we have been trained by the world, we can be controlled by the world by simply what they say. Think of this now. If Jesus can't operate in an environment or in a person filled with unbelief, then how is it that the world can so freely operate in your life, even if you say you don't believe? It's because we actually, we, we don't understand the word belief. And this is where we're going to get real scientific about this word of belief. Do I believe or not? Check your lifestyle. Check how you are evaluating what God is saying. Because I'm evaluating Jesus by his relatives. I'm evaluating him by the flesh. I'm evaluating him by my senses. I'm evaluating him by his natural history. I'm not evaluating him by his origin. I'm not evaluating him by who he says he is or even what the Holy Spirit would even tell me who he is in that moment. So how is it that we got so much poverty, we got so much disease, we got so much war, so much crime, people are doing all kinds of things to make a living, whether it's good or not, why would they have to do that? Why would they have to go that far? Why would they have to do that type of thing to get something good in their life to happen? It's because... They have been programmed without their knowledge of it into a carnal or a physical human nature. And that physical human nature, the Bible says, is the God of this world that programmed it. They didn't even know it was happening. And then when God comes along, he's coming along to destroy the program with a new message. But see, I want you to see the conflict here. We believe things we don't know we believe. You believe that poverty is powerful. You believe. You don't know you believe. So I don't believe that. You believe it is. You believe that sickness is real. You believe that people have to, go, you know, suffer in certain ways. And this is why you get angry about it because you say, I'm just so upset at that situation. I'm so upset because this is, because it seems so real to you. Instead of approaching the thing from God's point of view and saying, wait a minute, that's not even a real thing. The reason why it's finding any form in the earth is because I actually believe it's true. I have believed someone else's word over God's. This is so, listen. If we can stop Jesus from functioning because of unbelief, why don't we just find out what unbelief is and unbelieve the world? If unbelief, listen, I don't think you're getting this. Unbelief stopped God. Unbelief can't stop poverty. I think we're just unbelieving the wrong thing. And this is what we don't want to attack or approach. And I, I, I really started checking results on things. And you know, in case you haven't noticed, the last, I mean, I guess since last October, there's been a lot of great things happening in terms of spiritual manifestations of healings and blessings and financial things and all that happening more and more. Why? It's because we're getting down to the science of what does it mean to be a citizen or a cultural believer of the kingdom and, and functioning in it versus what is doubt? Doubt, the root of that is two or double. It means you have two beliefs. You, have, you might even have faith in God. But you also have faith in the world. In other words, I still believe that's true too. How many Christians have ever told you, well, you know, that's just life. Something happens to you, well, you know, can't control everything. You know, God is just, sometimes he's teaching you a little something. Well, you know, it, it just, sometimes it, it must have been God's will, you know, we, we tried our best. You know, I, I think maybe some of y'all watched my Facebook, my, di my dad passed away in, on Father's Day weekend on Friday. You know, you know, they called me to go visit him. He's doing bad. He's doing bad. You know, call. you know what? My relatives don't think the way I think. Some of y'all got relatives like that? I said, listen, he's got a terminal illness. I said, listen, uh, I'm not coming down there to see him away. I said, if I come down there, because they don't understand what I understand, so I had to be real short about it. 
I said, I'm only coming to be his last hope. So when I get there, I don't need nobody there that don't believe this. And listen, when I got there, he was so far gone. When I got there, I didn't, y'all understand. I didn't go to him and say, well, it looks like this is the end. I know he believed in God and, you know, at some point in his life, I understand. But this ain't God's will. I, I know better than this. It didn't even, I mean, he looked so bad, it didn't bother me one bit. Y'all, as his last hope, everybody around, I didn't get everybody to clear out of the room like I wanted to. And I found out later why this is such a hard situation. I mean, he's been pumped his whole life. Bad conduct. Not pursuing God. Couldn't get him to go to church. My mom died the same way. Can't, couldn't drag him to church. Couldn't, I mean, begging and pleading. If he had had an inkling of faith. I mean, it was double hard. I, I went in there. I said, he's, he can barely move. I grabbed his hands. I jerked his hands up. And I bear hugged him underneath like this. And I jacked him up off the bed. And I said, it's now or never. I know you're healed. You are going to have to receive this. This is it. And I, and I did that, and I didn't, I didn't say anything about, see you later, Dad, blah, 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 nothing. And he died a couple of days later. I said, you know, I'm not blaming God for not moving. But here's what I will tell everyone. And, I don't, and I'm, okay, you know, I'm okay with that, right? If, if I had gotten him out of that situation... If I could find just the just the ounce, I mean, just the ounce of faith. If I could find an ounce of faith, he'd be here right now. But he lived his whole life conducting unbelief. His entire life, even though he had faith in God. I hope y'all are getting my message today. Because there's a lot of things that you're dealing with that you don't have to. And you got faith for change, but you don't have belief for change. And belief comes with when you willfully allow the culture of God to rule in your life. And that means I'm going to have to wrestle against symptoms. I'm going to have to wrestle against lies. I'm going to have to wrestle against bad company. I'm going to have to wrestle against my old tendencies. And I'm going to have to fight it out. I'm going to have to fight a fight of faith that will allow me to conduct power that will change not just my life, but others. If you think you're blessed when the world was giving you blessing, wait till God touches you. You ain't seen no blessing. Listen, can I say this? When the children of Israel wanted to go back to Egypt, they went back for food. Because God supplied them miracle food every day. They wanted food they could know where it was coming from. Carnal minded. Don't be so easily satisfied that when the world offers you another breadcrumb that you run back so fast. So easily satisfied. I'll take that little blessing. I'll take that little opportunity. When God, you were right. You were right there for the. I mean, for the life to be completely transformed, to be a world-changing and sustainable blessing, not one a flash in the pan and nobody remembers you later. I've said a lot, but I'm out of time. Can you stand on your feet? I hope I put some handles on this thing for you today. That's why I tried to walk Pastor Kevon up here. Did y'all see that? And if any of y'all seen how he was walking yesterday, you know that's big. I'm trying to empower. It ain't about me. It's about what God is doing in a body. I'm trying to empower you wherever you go this week. Don't you dare just let your faith sit idle. Be a believer. Don't let, your, don't let any mountains stare you in the face and not be dealt with. I want you to get with God. And I want you to say, Lord, how do I deal with this? And then you start speaking. Speak with obedience. Speak what God tells you to speak. I want you to start canceling the assignments against you. I want you to start standing in the face of your bully. And stand your ground. You won't lose. I promise you, you're not going to lose. If you stand with God, God's on your side. Remember that. When, and you stand your ground. And you command. And you stand your... I don't care what you see after you release it. You just know it shall be, it shall be done. It shall come to pass. Amen? All right. So next week, I want you to bring some people with you. We're going to continue our expansion at this ministry. Our community needs this teaching. Grab every ungodly person you can find, every sick person, every lame person, every person in a need. Uh, even if they've never been to church, bring them. Amen? And by the way, when you start doing that, the devil's going to fight you for that, but get in his face and go get those people. Amen? Can you raise your hands? Let me speak a blessing over you, Father. We are not just people of faith. We are also believers. God, we have the conduct of heaven. We are going to, in every possible way, we know we're blessed. We know we're favored. We know we're righteous in Christ. But this week, we're going to do every, whatever level we understand the kingdom, we're going to conduct it. We're going to conduct it. 
We're going to keep conducting it. We're going to let heaven's power flow through us. We're going to be more innovative than ever, more creative than ever, more blessed than ever, more powerful than ever because you're going to flow through our conduct. Let our mouth and our bodies be instruments of righteousness this week. We submit it to you, Lord. Use our conduct to transfer heaven into the earth. In Jesus' name, shout amen. Amen. God bless you guys, and we'll see you next Sunday.